Yes, yeah, so I think Nicola has given a really good introduction to the the reasons why the project came about and how it came about and the close working relationship we've had with Hammersmith and Fulham as a, as a council, but also the residents of the social housing estate's been working on. And the aim of this second presentation is really, I'm a landscape architect, I should say, at the Ground London, is to look at some of the, the design ideas that resulted from that engagement with the residents and how we followed those design ideas through to construction and some of the problems and issues we faced along, along the line. I just pulled out the three objectives from the, the wider Life Plus project um, set of objectives. There were six or seven. These are the top three. But we're looking at trying to find low-cost, cost-effective, transferable measures that are applicable on the estates that we've looked at but can also be rolled out across housing estates within the council but also across, across boroughs, um, uh, across London. And, and as part of being an EU-funded project as well, it's about replicability, replicability across the EU as well. Um, we wanted to, it's really key in the ties I talk about green infrastructure, we really wanted, and I think we had to deliver these, these, these measures of these improvements to address, address climate change issues through green infrastructure because it's provided us a chance to engage with residents about multiple functions that these things can achieve in their landscape, not just some of the climate change functions that we initially focused on. Um, and, and, and I won't go too much more on the green teams, but it's really been an excellent experience working with the green teams and getting people um, trained and back into employment through the experience of delivering these, these features on, on the landscape. So Nicola mentioned that there were three estates that we, we looked at in, in the borough. Um, the one at the top, Queen Caroline Estate, just over 260 properties on that estate, quite a big estate next to Hammersmith Bridge Road near, near the Hammersmith, the centre Ham, central, central of Hammersmith. Cheeseman's Terrace, which you can access from kind of West Kensington. Um, quite a dense estate five-storey buildings, not much open space. And then a, a very much smaller site, which is just three buildings, Sill, Thatcher, Eric McDonald, Rich and Light Houses, which is only 30 properties um, down towards the, the south, um, near kind of the Fulham Broadway, Parsons Green area. Um, and really, today, I was just going to go through each of these estates and look at some of the, the challenges that were faced on each of the estates in terms of the physical characteristics of them and some of the, the issues that arose from residents and from discussions with the council and how we tried to draw together those physical characteristics, information that was provided by, by the borough, um, the discussion and, and feedback we got from residents, and also some of the technical issues as well. The project as a whole is, 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 is a big one. We've been working on it for two and a half years now. It includes a number of stages. So the initial, initial part was all about survey and analysis, and we looked at the kind of wider context of these estates. Not only looking at flooding issues, but looking at things like air quality concerns in the area, especially around, say, Queen Caroline Estate, where you've got major roads nearby. Um, we looked about the ac access to play, access to open space, and tried to see how some of those things might influence what we did. We then went on to do some analysis at the site level, which then led us to kind of come up with a kind of options identification and prioritisation process, which I'll talk a little bit more on, before we headed off into design, consulting residents on those designs, and then moving forward into construction. There's a nice picture there of some, some of the green team measures, prepping one of the linear basins um, that we, we put in, and there'll be a, a finished picture of that later. And finally, the, the stage which is, is ongoing at the minute and hopefully will extend beyond the end of the project as well is, is, is monitoring. So installation of weather stations, um, cameras to record how these basins are filling up and how the suds features are working, um, doing some flow monitoring and things as well within the scheme. A key part of the European funding is that we demonstrate um, the benefits that these, these features are providing. And just to mention, so we, had, we were working with supported by an advisory group, including the Environment Agency, um, Syria, the GLA, Landscape Institute, National Housing Federation, so a number of large organisations with an interest in what we're doing, but an ability also to support us in what we're doing have been very helpful throughout the project. And then on a kind of technical delivery basis, we've been working with some consultancy support from people like the Ecology Consultancy, Green Roof Consultancy, um, EPG, Steve's here today, um, and some structural engineering advice for the Green Roofs from Richard Jackson as well. So as a landscape team, we've been taking responsibility for the project from start to finish, but we've had support all the way through from both kind of advisory kind of bodies, but also um, people who could support us with the technical information too. So just to start with, to start with the smallest one, Silver Thatch, Eric McDonald and Richard Knight Houses, the, the top, you can see the, the three fairly large um, four or five, um, four or three storey blocks with flat roofs and some green space in between set within a kind of landscape of 
of uh, period properties with a, with a large park, Yieldbrook Common, um, um, just adjacent to the, to the land. In terms of its physical characteristics, it's quite a compact site. Um, there's not lots and lots of open space, but what there is is relatively well defined. There's two car parks, there's garden areas, which are generally just amenity grass, which are relatively well used. Um, use of space is, is relatively well defined. The residents tend to use it, obviously, in summertime. They're getting out and using the grass areas in between times, other times of year, maybe less so. Access and movement as well. Access for vehicles and, and, and movement for people through the paths are fairly well defined. Not much opportunity within a constrained space to fundamentally change the layout of the, uh, the landscape. And nor did we really want to for cost purposes. We're trying to come up, come up with cost effective ways of retrofitting, so fitting this in with the existing, this existing landscape. One of the really dominant things here, though, is, is the flat roofs, so three large flat roofs plus multiple um, pram sheds and bin stores, which have small scale flat roofs as well, that we saw as an opportunity. Uh, one problem in terms of technical problem, this is, um, is internal downpipes in all cases on the buildings. So accessing some of the water from the roofs was difficult. Just a few photographs and just kind of to talk about some of the issues that residents raised. Um, they mentioned roof leaks and, and problem with water pooling at the entrances. So the top left image is a, a, is a well, it's basically a block gully on, on top of the roof causing some pooling. That was on a nice sunny day. I think on a wet day it would be more extensive than that. Um, some issues with pooling as well at, uh, at ground level. So you see the, the plan with Richard Knight House. This was just a little drainage plan we did to work out the little the sub catchments and where water was, it was flowing into the gullies. The gullies are marked um, with the kind of uh, squares with the crosses. And the little red patches are where uh, we identified areas of water pooling just from our own walk around surveys. And the one just outside Richard Knight House is right in the middle of the entrance, the main entrance to the building. It was actually causing a key problem for one of the residents who, who uses a walker to move around. And after, shortly after heavy rain, because of the dip in the surfacing, there's quite a large amount of pooling there and quite an obstacle there. She was, wasn't able to go you know, through the shrub beds or around onto, onto the grass. So a small thing, you know, we, we've been looking to begin with at the big scale flooding issues and surface water problems, but actually small scale water pooling on a site can cause real problems for residents. And solving those solutions can really open up the opportunities to kind of engage residents um, with regards to the issues, which is something that, that Nicola touched on. And common themes come out. I mean, people are enthusiastic about food praying. I, I was a little, we had some quite bold numbers in the bid to start with. And I was like, really, are we going to get, you know, we're going to get people involved? But we've now put a decent number of food growing beds in. And every time I go around there, it, it kind of makes me smile because they are currently full of fruit and veg and flowers. And some of these have only been in place since kind of early summer. And they are really active. And part of that is the work we do to work with gardening groups to make that happen. But it's, it's lovely to see. And there's a general desire for more colour and interest in the landscape. So this was a before picture of that green space between the two buildings. You see it's fairly yeah, standard amenity turf. As I say, they use it in summer, but, but not, not much the rest of the time. So we took into account the site characteristics. We also thought about discussions with residents. And then obviously we had discussions with the client, Hamilton Fulham, and also thought about some of the technical considerations. And, and key things that came out, we obviously knew there was a... Well, by the ex extensive nature of the kind of flat roofs, we thought that there might be an opportunity there in terms of green roofs. And we talked to the council quite a bit, and it turned out that they had a, a basically a, a planned programme of, of, of refurb and upgrade of, of, of the roofs. So we spoke to them, and it, it turned out there was an opportunity on Richard Knight House where the roof was due to have the waterproofing insulation replaced. And we'd, at the same time, found this opportunity in terms of green infrastructure in terms of getting a green roof. So we worked closely with the council a number of meetings, and eventually we got working with their... Um, with a term contractor, we managed to almost split the cost. So, you know, the, the scaffolding and the things that required the green roof to happen um, covered by the council, and we covered the green the greening element on top. And it was really a nice way of kind of dovetailing planned planned program maintenance and upgrade with um, with potential for greening. This comment that Nicola made about minimal increase in maintenance is key on all, all the estates. It's quite difficult to quantify. Um, because of the nature of trying to understand hard and soft landscape maintenance in terms of gully maintenance, all these issues. But we wanted to keep it as low as possible. And then obviously, technical considerations, we, we had um, structure engineer go and look, and he, he said there was, uh, you know, there was room for greeting load on, on, the, on the roofs. Um, as I mentioned, the internal downpipes kind of drove a, a, certain, a certain design option, which I'll mention. Um, and there was limited space at, at ground level. 
we did quite an extensive options identification, screening and prioritisation process. So we, we, we walked around the sites and working with the consultants, we identified a range of options that we thought would be good to, uh, to, to implement on the sites. And then we did, came up with a massive spreadsheet basically, <laughs> full of things to try and multi-criteria analysis, weighting and try to understand the process. Um, but in reality, I think a lot of it is about sitting around the table and discussing and trying to make physical characteristics, resident needs, and, and some of the environmental needs kind of mesh together. So I'm not going to show you more spreadsheets after that. So, so one of the examples of a number of characteristics coming together. So it's a compact site with large um, areas of flat roofing. We knew there was some issues with roof leaks. Whether they were attributable to the, the pooling we saw or not, we don't know. There's a desire for more colour and interest. There's this planned programme of upgrade of, of roofs. There's lots of bin stores and pram sheds. They need refurbishment as well. Um, roof structures could take additional loading. The internal downpipes meant that it would be very difficult for us to get the runoff from the roof and manage it in the adjacent landscape. And there's limited space at ground level, even if we had managed to get the water out from those internal downpipes. So the obvious thing was in this case to potentially look at you know, relatively large scale kind of um, use of, of green roofs, uh, which you'll see was, was a key, key element. And the other thing was, it was because it was a compact, organized site, there was this interest in food growing, a desire for more colour and interest. So we're really looking at quite small-scale measures that have a relatively high impact. The low-level green roofs, which I've shown some pictures of, are important, uh, but also fitting in things like food growing within the landscape, not making fundamental changes. So <clears throat> it's quite nice this, in the sense that, not the image necessarily, but this was a sketch design we did over uh, about 14, 15 months ago. We used this to present a broad idea to the council and, and also to... Um, to residents, so we talked about wanting an extensive green roof on the Richard Knight, the residential block, low-level extensive green roofs, a small linear basin to take some of the water that was pooling outside the, the entrance to Richard Knight House, which is the block at the back, some fruit growing space, you know, spalier trees, getting, uh, getting um, fruit trees in there, and also these other features, a rain garden and a tree trench, basically, um, so water from adjacent paving, and actually number 17, Parthenia Road, so not even water from the housing estate, but water from an adjacent property was draining onto this landscape and we were able to route that into a, uh, into a kind of uh, a tree trench, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. And this is kind of, this was a sketch 16 months ago, but it is kind of how it is today. <laughs> it's rare that happens, but it did, it did follow through. And we got good support for what we did. So on top of the roof, we put in, installed a, a green roof system, um, working with, let's say, the term contractor at uh, Mighty, but also their, their roof and contractor Bowder and also Dusty Edge from Green Roof Consultancy as well. So we're trying to kind of come up with innovative ways of, of, of putting this green roof on. And it's a test roof as well, so we're doing flow monitoring from the roof and looking at the biodiversity. And that's why it has this kind of grid structure. So we're testing various different depths of substrate. And we've also used a, a material called Aquaten, um, so a kind of web-like structure that's able to absorb water and, and release water back into the environment in times of water stress. We want to see how that, that works. So basically each of these grid elements has different planting method, different substrate depth, and some of them have this aquatene in and others don't. So it's the ability for us to not only put the green roof on, but to explore some of the kind of the performance of various aspects of the green roof, which is a nice thing that obviously part of an EU funded project we're able to do. We also put in some low level green roofs. So the, the buildings, this is a view from the main roof looking down. Um, the, the buildings in the middle are pram, pram, pram sheds. So they'd only just been planted probably a couple of weeks before this. So you can only just see the, the green coming through. But they're all low-level green roofs, edged with kind of gabions with, with, with pebbles in, uh, kind of uh, extensive roof substrate and planted up with kind of wildflower species. Um, this feature on the right-hand side is the rain garden and the tree pit. So any water coming from the building, which is just out of picture at the top, and the path, and any um, coming off those roofs, comes down onto the pavement, pavement, runs into a channel. You can just about see it here. So it's a linear channel that runs down the path, and that takes all the water first into the... Um, into the rain garden, and then underneath the rain garden, underneath the tree pit, there's a kind of a rock-filled trench, which is a structural soil, so a mixture of rock and soil. And so that whole trench has quite a large capacity to take, take water, surface water, and provides a nice feature. It's, we only had to take a small slither of the car park, which was an, an, it was a, has caused no problems at all in terms of parking, um, but we're able to deal with a relatively large amount of water, plus introduce colour. So a small feature in quite a tight landscape, providing the things that the, the residents wanted. You also see the three food grain beds which we've integrated, I guess, into that, that kind of that small area of the of the site. So the next estate, Queen Caroline Estate, which is the one near Hammersmith. You can see the Hammersmith kind of fly over in the top. 
um, the River Thames and Hammersmith Bridge in, in the bottom left corner. A very different site, so far bigger, far more buildings, far, far more green space, open space. A lot of the buildings have pitch roofs. Um, some of them have internal downpipes, some external, um, but there was far, far more um, open space for us to use in terms of managing, managing the water. You see that in the plan. This is just one section of the estate. So a large open structured site. A lot of the space, both hard standing and, and grass, is fairly unused or not used at all before the, before the project. Um, maybe people might use it to lie out in the, summer, in, in, in the sun sometimes, but you rarely saw, in fact, through the course of projects until we did the work, I rarely saw people really using the spaces. And lots of large paving areas that previously had been used as... Um, it's kind of drying areas, but people now don't tend to like to dry their clothes in communal areas, as maybe they did in the past. So these are basically just large paved areas um, that weren't being used. And also, because of the layouts and barriers to movement, the, the, you've got Hammersmith Bridge Road at the top and Queen Caroline Street, and there's lots of people cutting through. And to cut through, you have to kind of take that route through. There's no direct route. So we were kind of keen to try and improve access through the site um, as part of the scheme. Some pictures um, from before. <laughs> That isn't a suds feature at the top left. That's just some pooling all over the roads. And this is, you see this everywhere across the estate, I think it's fair to say, before the work happens. <clears throat> Number of spaces, that's just a turning circle. And after a reasonable amount of rain, uh, that was in, uh, in July, just before on holiday, um, yeah, the, the pooling came about. Lots of spaces like this, which are fenced off with low knee rails, the one in the top right-hand corner. Signs saying, you know, no dogs on this space. Nobody uses it. It was absolutely had, had no use at all. And was in, you know, was kept kept in reasonable condition. The, you know, the shrubs were given a, a bit of a clip, and the and the lawn was mowed, but, but not much else than that. And then at the bottom, one of the kind of large paved areas that we found on on the estate. Um, there were, as I say, um, similarly with the other estate, they were keen to expand their free grain. They already had a little herb garden, but they wanted to take that a bit further. Um, and this desire for more colour and interest in the landscape. So I was just, we've done about. I think we've done six or seven projects on this estate already. We're planning another, hopefully another four or five. So this estate is going to have quite extensive sustainable drainage features when we finish with it. Um, the residents are still sticking with us, which is good. And they're really, in fact, really enthusiastic about what we're doing. Um, so this is one of this, uh, the sites, large, unused, fenced off green space. This is a drying area, or previously used as drying. It's a large paved area. Um, and, we, and also this shows people, the natural walking line would be to cut across the green space. They can't do it because of the fence. And we were looking to address those access issues and make this space a more interesting space. So again, a, a sketch design of what we were planning initially. So this was back, say, 16 months ago. Our idea was to take water from the downpipes of the community centre, Adela House, four-storey block and a, and a single-storey block, Sophia House, and take that water across paved areas and into the, the green, into the grass areas and, and create a series of, of kind of retention basins within the landscape. Um, there's some pictures of the, the finished landscape. So at the top, you've got some grass basins. There's a little kind of uh, overflow swell between two grass basins. We've integrated some playful features, typical things, um, stepping logs, boulders, so people can get out there and use the, use the landscape. This is on that same July day, just before I went on holiday. George was there half an hour before me. We were both going, Let's go and see if this works. And we both walked down there and, and found some water in the beaches. The bottom end, was, it is where we had the, um, the drying area. We've created a new, uh, what we termed a stony basin. Um, it's actually fixed materials, largely. It's resin band aggregate and boulders with some loose aggregate at the base. Originally, we wanted this to be loose materials, but it was a key concern of the, um, of the residents and of the council not to have potential missiles and things that could be used. So we had to come up with a an alternative approach and use some fixed materials. But it's really transformed the landscape. You see there's a kind of a boardwalk or a bridge, steel um, boardwalk or bridge going through the middle. So that now provides a direct route through from one road to the other. And likewise, the diagonal path that we've taken through the grass area as well improves access through the site. Some other pictures from the estate. Um, this top one, you'll see a little drainage channel running across a, a, a tarmac path, going to a little pebble <coughs> channel, which runs into this linear um, swale feature with some Check dams, which are gabion filled dams, and little kind of beams for people, to, for kids to play and run across. And it's filled with a kind of suds wildflower um, meadow turf. Um, and the hedge on the left hand side is actually the back hedge of a private garden. So we've had some great responses from some people, particularly Carolyn, who lives at number four, 
she basically let us go in and, and do some work in, the, in her private back garden to route the water from the downpipe across her back garden, then across the path and into the swale. And she offered to be like a, a demonstration to see if we could get this to work on one private garden. There's lots of private gardens all around the estate. If we can prove it on one and get it to work, hopefully there's opportunities, there's capacity within that as well to add at least another downpipe or two into it. So it's worked well so far, and we're, we're keen to maybe add to it. See, so that's another view of the, um, of the grass basin and the stony basin. They have an overflow between them. They're a connected system. We did um, green roofs. Um, this is organic roofs who, who delivered these roofs for us. Um, that was a, a few weeks ago. A bit of a problem with the plant fat hen taking over, but we need to try and sort that out. But generally, nice greening and taking a you know, fairly underused facility in terms of the pram sheds and, um, and, and things and making them a more exciting feature that's also serving a sustainable drainage pur purpose. And obviously, you see someone there. Um, Hammersmith Bridge Road is right in the back. She's walking towards it, and we've now provided a nice direct through, route through, this, through the site for her. In the final estate, <clears throat> we haven't actually implemented any measures here yet, but it was just to kind of keep the context. If you compare this, just skip back. Oh. Lots and lots of green space on this site. If we go to Cheeseman's Terrace, far denser. So these are five story blocks. Five story blocks used to be connected by an aerial walkway. The aerial walkway was taken down because of concerns, um, various antisocial behaviour concerns. And now you've got these five story blocks um, separated, but with lots of hard space and not much green space. The green space is limited to courtyards. The courtyards are separated from buildings with private gardens, sometimes internal dam pipes. Actually, getting water into those landscape features was difficult. Plus, it's very dense, so we've got to try and find way, different ways of managing water on this estate. This is a kind of a sketch drawing. <clears throat> we were thinking about potentially green roofs on the top of the building, taking some of the water out of balcony levels. These kind of this kind of staggered drainage through the building. So some of the water drains directly from the roof into the sewer. Some of the water from balconies drains to the next level and then down onto the road surface. So although we didn't have the open space either side of the buildings, we had real opportunities on balconies and near the building to take bits of water out. Small green roofs as well, potentially on the entrance hall, uh, entrance halls. Um, so some of the ideas we looked at, um, doing some kind of stormwater planters and taking water in from the downpipes, taking some water at balcony level, which is the top right-hand image, and, and, and enabling them to have some planting areas as well as some sort of storage on balconies. Little dropping green roofs, there's probably 100 of these little entrance portrait roofs, and we thought if we could come up with a, a kind of drop-in system, a tray system, which we could plant up, a fairly easy way of getting a, a green roof into the entrance porches. And, and then when we did have slightly larger, the, the bottom... Uh, middle at the bottom picture is it, it, we have a bit more space in the um, in the paved area, and we're proposing to have rain gardens that both take balcony water but also drain highway water into them from the adjacent highway. And if we've got sufficient quantity, and this is I've got a walk around with Steve next week to have a look at this. Potentially, we might be able to take um, we might make that a, a kind of a, a trench as well, and have a kind of rock filled or structural soil beneath the rain gardens. And then there's the what next. Um, we really, we've learned a huge amount from doing the project. Um, really enjoyed it. We've been able to work with residents, come up with new ideas and change their landscape. We've had some lovely feedback from residents. Uh, we did a walk around. I think George and Paul were there. Maybe Suzanne as well, where the residents came along and there was a kind of Q&A and they were able to describe why these measures have been put into the landscape as well as the things they enjoyed, which is really lovely to see. As, as Nicola mentioned, we've, we've just submitted another life application. I hope it was due in... 16 minutes ago, so <laughs> myself and Ian would, would help me, it's got him, but really we're looking at the potential to scale up this retrofit. We were at GLA event the other day, um, Ian was there, it presented as well, and there was a lot of talk about top down, how can we make these things happen, you know, a water commissioner or something else in London, how can we make this grow? And I was sat there, I had a chat to I'm Jenny Scopel from the EA afterwards, and I'm kind of thinking, from our point of view, the type of organisation we are, we're really interested in just getting stuck in at ground level, engaging people and trying to make it, make it happen that way from the bottom up. So yes, there probably are changes that need to happen top down, but I think there's also huge opportunities to do these things um, from bottom up as well. So fingers crossed in, in, in June, another project might happen, but even if it doesn't, I fully intend for all of these things, for Groundwork as an organisation, many other organisations doing this type of work, there's plenty of opportunities to, to roll out this retrofit, retrofit work and it's, it's, yeah, it's a really enjoyable thing. Thank you. Thank you.